A warm welcome everyone participating in this webinar. Uh, my name is Willemijn Kaiser and I am the executive director of the Netherlands America Foundation. The Netherlands America Foundation organizes webinars and lectures on business, cultural and historical topics of importance to Dutch American relations. Today's webinar, Dutch Slave Resistance in New York, is very special to us for a multitude of reasons. Uh, among others, it is the NUF's first transatlantic partnership with the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies in Middleburg, the Netherlands. So thank you, Rias, for partnering with us. And thank you to all our panelists today for sharing your research and insights on this important topic with us. The Netherlands America Foundation is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. And our mission is to strengthen the bonds between the US and the Netherlands. To accomplish this, we fund educational exchanges for Dutch and American students and scholars. We sponsor cultural exchanges and foster business ties. To make this possible, please consider becoming a member. If you'd like to, more, if you'd like to learn more about the NUF, you can visit us at www.nuf.org. Our next webinar, Differences in Diversity, will be on Tuesday, June 9th at noon. And on Sunday, June 27th, we're organizing a virtual concert, Music in the Time of COVID-19, featuring Dutch, featuring Nuff Alums, Alicia Silverstein on violin and Shin Wang on her on harpist chords. You can sign up for these events on our website on the events tab. We hope that you'll enjoy this webinar and join us for future Nuff events. Thank you all so much. Damien, over to you. Thank you very much, Willemijn. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished panel, as well as our guests from the Netherlands and the United States. My name is Damien Pargas, and I'm the director of the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies in Middelburg, uh, the Netherlands. The RIAS is a research center and a graduate school that is formally affiliated with Leiden University, where I'm also a professor of North American history. I'm very excited about this webinar today partly because it's a wonderful opportunity to host a live transatlantic event on a topic of such importance to both our communities, but more selfishly because this is a topic that I'm dying to know more about. Uh, so let me say a little bit about uh, how we came up with the theme for today. Uh, I'm a historian of American slavery, and like most slavery scholars, I've always been primarily focused on the southern states. And recently I was poking around the office in Middleburg and I discovered a Dutch Roosevelt family Bible from early New York. This was a gift from the Roosevelt family to the Institute back in the 80s. And I noticed that it uh, had belonged to none other than Johannes Roosevelt, John Roosevelt, who lived in New York from 1689 to 1750. Now, I think most scholars know John Roosevelt as the progenitor of the Theodore Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt side of the Roosevelt family. He was also the son of the original Roosevelt emigrants to New Netherland back in the 17th century from Zeeland province. Um, slavery historians, however, know Johannes Roosevelt primarily as the owner of Quack, the enslaved man who was accused of instigating the 1741 slave rebellion during which Fort George and much of New York was burned to the ground. Holding this Dutch family Bible in my hands that quack must have passed by every day living in that household uh, got me thinking for the first time really about the experiences of enslaved people like quack owned by Dutch families in New York um, and in particular their role in acts of resistance in the history of New York slavery, not just trying to burn down New York City, but also uh, running away and, and even their involvement in abolitionism like Sojourner Truth. So when Willemijn and I were brainstorming about a topic for this webinar, we thought it would be really interesting to bring together some of the best minds working on this theme. Uh, Michael Dauma from Georgetown University, uh, Andrea Mosterman from the University of New Orleans, and Margaret Washington from Cornell University, um, and to have a public discussion about it, uh, a transatlantic discussion. So without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator of that discussion, uh, Russell Shorto. Russell is a renowned American author, journalist, historian, uh, and senior scholar at the New Netherland Institute. He's the author of several books and a regular contributor to the New York Times Magazine. Um, he's most famous over here in the Netherlands, I can tell you, for his excellent book on the Dutch origins of New York City uh, called The Island at the Center of the World about New Amsterdam. Russell was also director of the John Adams Institute here in Amsterdam from 2008 to 2013. And in 2009, he was knighted into the order of Oranje Nassau for his strengthening of Dutch-US relations. Uh, Russell, 
um, and you prefer not to be called Sir Russell, but officially I think we should. Uh, Russell, thank you so much for participating today and I will give the floor to you. Oh, thank you very much, Damien. Uh, that was an overly generous introduction, uh, but I'll live with it. Um, so thank you to the Netherland America Foundation and the Roosevelt Institute for American Studies for hosting this event. Thank you to professors Margaret Washington, um, Michael Dauma, and Andrea Mosterman for participating. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, um, so I would like to jump right in and um, uh, first, let me uh, quickly ask each of you to give us in one minute or less what you would like to talk about today, what you would like our audience to focus on. Um, and uh, Margaret Washington, how about if I begin with you? What, 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 will we, what will you be talking about in a few minutes? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and I have to begin by saying that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation, member, members of the Houdé-Nosani Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. And the Confederacy proceed, precedes the establishment of Cornell, uh, the colony of New Netherlands, the province and state of New York and the United States of America. And so we want to acknowledge the painful history of the Hosandani dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Hosandani past and present on these lands and waters. Having said that, and that's not unrelated to the New Netherlands um, because uh, the African presence in New Netherlands was uh, very important uh, from an indigenous perspective as well. Uh, there was a lot of interaction between Africans and uh, indigenous people. Uh, but primarily my research uh, as far as Dutch history is concerned, focuses on Sojourner Truth, who was an African Dutch woman who lived in um, Ulster County, born and raised in Ulster County, about 50 miles north of New York. Uh, and. Uh, when I wrote the book, I realized how important Dutch culture was to Sojourner. And so I had an, an entire section of the book on uh, Dutch culture uh, and the ambiance of uh, Sojourner Truth. So for my comments, uh, I would hope that we could uh, spend some time focusing on uh, African Dutch culture um, not so much from my perspective as uh, resistance in terms of rebellions and runaways, but uh, challenges to slavery nonetheless. Uh, and I think that Sojourner uh, Isabella, as she was uh, her birth name, uh, personifies that um, not only in terms of flight because she did take her own freedom, but accountability, uh, custom, treatment uh, that in a way sort of distinguishes to some extent Dutch slavery from English slavery, because I was trained as a Southern historian. Uh, and so I came at New York history and New York slavery uh, from the perspective of the South. And so I made some, I think, very interesting comparisons. So those are the kinds of perimeters that uh, I'm comfortable uh, talking about and answering questions about. Okay, thanks for that. Michael Dauma? Sure, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the past three years, I've been writing about um, Dutch slavery in New York, taking a sort of a, a total approach, uh, looking at everything. And what it's narrowed down to for me, where my contributions can be is in economics. And so um, I've been writing a book, which is, I don't know, maybe 80% complete about the economics of slavery in Dutch New York um, after New Netherlands. So after 1664, today I'll be presenting uh, one chapter of that book that I'm working on. And this is a chapter, which is a quantitative analysis of runaway slave records. So essentially I have uh, looked uh, extremely hard to find every uh, newspaper mention of a runaway slave from 1730 to 1825. I have 385 of them now, and I'm able to analyze these and tell us something uh, 
about what's going on in New York based on um, these numbers. Thank you. Andrea Mosterman. Thanks, Russell. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's, it's really great to be participating in this and I'm glad that there's more and more um, attention to the history of enslaved people in Dutch New York. Um, I have just finished a book on um, slavery in the Dutch communities in early New York. Uh, and much of what I'll be talking about today relates to the research that I've done for that. Um, I looked at the, the ways in which Dutch enslavers in early New York really uh, contained and controlled or tried to control and save people in these areas, in these communities, and how enslaved people in New York responded to that. And um, really looking at it through the whole period of slavery, which was 200 years in New York, which is quite significant. It's longer than Georgia had uh, slavery. And uh, so it's a, a long period of slavery. And of course, a lot of things change over the course of that period. And that is one of the things that I've actually looked at and how these, how slavery in New York changes, how the enslavement of people changes in New York and how enslaved people um, respond to that and, and um, use the various ways that they can to, to achieve freedom or obtain freedom or, or at least improve their circumstances or the circumstances for their children. Um, and loved ones as best as they can. So that's what I'd love to talk about. <laughs> okay, thanks for that uh, quick overview. Now we have a sense of, okay, we're gonna zoom in on, there's one, one person and, and I'm sure the, the most famous uh, person associated with uh, Dutch slavery uh, and that's Sojourner Truth. And then we're gonna get it, come at it quantitatively. And then uh, Andrea is gonna kind of do the, the, the byways of uh, slavery and slave resistance in New York. Um, let's um, now come, maybe if we come at this in reverse order and, and begin uh, with Andrea, um, because her research, at least as I understand it, uh, starts chronologically. Uh, uh, earlier than than uh, Michael's and Margaret's. And uh, before I pose a question to you, uh, Andrea, let me, uh, as I introduce each of you, I'll, uh, I, I should give a, a little bit more of an introduction. Um, Andrea Musterman is Associate Professor in Atlantic History and Joseph Tregel Professor in Early American History at the University of New Orleans. In her work, she explores the multifaceted dimensions of slavery, the slave trade, and cross-cultural contact in the Dutch Atlantic and early America with a special emphasis on New York. Her forthcoming book, Spaces of Enslavement, A History of Slavery and Resistance in Dutch New York uh, will come out this fall and it won the uh, 2020 Hendricks Award for best book length manuscript related to New Netherland and the Dutch colonial experience. Um, Andrea, this is all about uh, uh, slavery within uh, Dutch context in uh, New York. Can you set that Dutch context? What was New Netherland for, for those who, who don't really have any, any sense of that? And then give us the, the extent of slavery and, and, and what slavery was in the Dutch colony. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so New Netherland, of course, is the Dutch colony that um, really, uh, it's a large region. Uh, today it would be uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, parts of Connecticut and Pennsylvania even. Um, so it's a large area that the Dutch claimed. Of course, they they were only found in, in just a, a few parts of it, predominantly in what is um, Manhattan and the surrounding areas, Long Island, Staten Island, like that particular part of um, New York. And then um, Albany was an, an important early settlement, uh, Beverwijk. Um, and those areas, the Dutch um, had, had various settlements and then in between along the Hudson River, they had an important settlement. There were some other places as well. So actually Nieuwe Amstel, which is um, in what today is Delaware for, for a period, the Dutch also had uh, extended New Netherland into that area. So, but, but that's the broader region. And um, it's in the 1620s that the West India Company for the first time actually brings people to the colony. And these are uh, families, European families that are settling in the area. And it's really not that long after that, that enslaved Africans um, arrive, are being brought to the colony. 
and um we don't know to this that we don't know the exact year but it's likely to be have been um around 1627 so um some suspect it maybe have been 26 others think it may have been 28 it's around that time that we see the first enslaved africans in the colony and um most of the enslaved africans in the area lived in um uh, Manhattan and the surrounding areas. Uh, there are fewer um, living also in, in the Beaverbank area, so really in the, in the Albany, New York region. And in the latter part of the 17th century, there's um, evidence that we see them also in what today is Kingston, New York. Um, and in New at Amstel, they actually have an, an effort to bring enslaved Africans there. And that's part of the, uh, the, the ship, the Gideon, which arrives in New York, uh, or which is then still New Amsterdam, the, the main colonial town on the southernmost point of Manhattan that brings uh, 290 enslaved people to the colony and a, a, a fourth of those are supposed to go to the Newark Amstel colony. So we see enslaved Africans and as Dr. Washington is, is pointing out, also enslaved indigenous people um, across the colony during the Dutch colonial period um, there's less evidence of indigenous people who were enslaved in the Dutch colonies, the Dutch communities, although um, they, they were there. Um, over the course of the 18th century, it's, it's clear from the records that there were uh, many indigenous people who were enslaved in early New York. So it's important to also acknowledge that. Um, so, but most of them would have been living in, in New Amsterdam and um, in the colonial town of New Amsterdam. <laughs> Okay, let me let me ask you to yeah. now quickly, if you could, uh, give us a sense of what what slavery was at that time in in New Netherland mm -hmm. in the 17th century. Because I think for a lot of us, maybe nearly all of us, we have an image. If we think of a slavery in America, you know, it's as people have said, it's the South, it's plantation, it's a, it's one thing. But in New Netherland, it was something quite else. Yeah, it was. And and actually, I think this is important that the work of Ira Berlin is very important here. He has shown how across the Americas and then across the North American colonies, slavery evolves and change over time, changes over time. So what we see in New Netherland in the 17th century is actually very similar to circumstances that we see, for example, in Virginia in the 17th century. And that is that um, there's no, no legislation yet in New Netherland that um, regulates slavery, that codifies slavery into law. There's no slave codes of any sort. And um, that changes by the latter part of the 17th century. So of course the, the English uh, initially take over the colony in 1664. Um, they, you know, there's there's some back and forth, and by the 1670s, it's it's permanently an English colony. It's in the latter part of the 17th century that we see slavery changing. Now, I, I, I really want to make sure that um, it's clear that this is not because I don't think that this is because it's become an English colony. It's changes that we actually see already during the Dutch colonial period, but really become more prominent by the latter part of the 17th century, and we see it across the colonies. So during the Dutch colonial period, we don't see any regulation of enslaved people, which means that enslaved Africans um, have access to the courts. Um, and again, it's not because there's any laws that say that they should be allowed to the courts, it's that there's an absence of any regulations that they cannot use the courts. Um, so they use the Dutch court system, um, they use the, uh, the they, they uh, attend the Dutch reformed church, they, um, many of them are able to actually obtain their freedom and um, own property in Manhattan. And so when we think about slave resistance in early New York, when we look at this early period, much of it is, is really working within the system as, as some scholars have used this language, uh, Linda Rupert and um, of course, Jane Landers um, have, have used that terminology of working within the system, as in and save people in, in certain circumstances can resist their bondage or uh, try to obtain more autonomy within their within their circumstances by using the system to their advantage. And so in, during the Dutch colonial system, that could be like the lack of 
uh, regulation, the lack of restrictions. There was nothing that kept them from doing certain things. And so we see in Saved Africans um, going to the court and actually uh, claiming to, um, uh, to not have received certain wages and win cases against Dutch settlers, Dutch white settlers. Um, sometimes they, they claim that their property um, was damaged by free white settlers and cases are won. So, uh, or they win these cases. So we see that that, that lack of um, regulation and restrictions allows them to do so. And it doesn't mean that there's not more, um, you know, that there aren't any unsafe people who, who try to flee the colony or these Dutch communities. But we do see that a lot of it is working within the system. Whereas once by the latter part of the 17th century, it becomes more regulated. And we do see clear slave codes in New York that actually really limit the movement and the activities of unsafe people. That's when we see that there's a, a, a different form of resistance where unsafe people try to work um, and, and resist those, those systems to um, expand their autonomy and, and their, their freedoms or, or um, to resist their bondage. Uh, and, and what uh, br brings about that change? Why, how, why do things become codified? Is it numbers? Uh, is uh, it, it, what's the, it, you said it wasn't simply the change from the Dutch to the English. So what does bring the change about? So we see th these changes across the colonies and, and even in some ways across the Americas that there's more clearly a shift to the enslavement of um, um, Africans and African descendants and that the, the system of enslavement becomes increasingly racialized with that shift and that there's also an increased reliance on the labor of enslaved Africans. And as their labor becomes more important and their numbers are growing. So in New York, we actually see that the numbers of enslaved Africans is growing increasingly over the course of the 18th century, um, especially like the numbers we see by the latter part of the 18th century are very different from what we see at the latter part of the 17th century. And just to give you an example, um, when we look at percentages, and I'm gonna take Kings County, which is Brooklyn, New York, which was an extreme, I will say that, um, that it, it was on the, the extreme end of what was happening in New York. But by 1790, in some of the townships in Brooklyn, about 40% um, of the population was enslaved. Um, so again, that was that that was an extreme. In other parts, we see that it's closer to 15 across the across the region, closer to 15 percent. But there are these pockets, and of course, uh, Brooklyn was a, an especially uh, Dutch stronghold in New York. So we also see that in that area, about 75 percent of the families, the Dutch families in Brooklyn, enslaved people within their homes. So the numbers definitely become more and more significant. And as these, this, this population grows, with that also comes an, an increased need to really restrict their movements and activities. And there's some very clear examples where um, enslaved people are actually uh, trying to resist bondage and that leads to, to certain codes. So for example, in 1708, there's an enslaved African um, woman and an enslaved indigenous man who actually uh, kill the family that enslaves them. It's the Hallett family and it's uh, also Long Island in Queens. And um, they kill the, the man, the woman who's pregnant and their children. And in response to that, um, they are burned <laughs> at the stake. Um, and we see that there's actually legislation that specifically says that they need to restrict the movements and activities of unsafe people more to avoid that from happening again. The same thing happens after the slave revolt in New York City in 1712. Again, in legislation in New York City itself and, and more regionally, we see that they are responding to that by imposing more regulation. So enslaved Africans in New York are increasingly um, limited in their movements. They are not allowed 
in many of these communities to actually gather with more, more than four people at the time. They're not allowed to uh, go on the streets without a lantern at night. They need a pass to be able to travel, to be able to, to really be in public spaces. They need to prove that they have permission from their enslavers. They're no longer allowed to actually um, um, sell or, or buy goods unless they have permission from their enslavers. At some point, they're not even allowed to rake for oysters unless there's a white person with them. So there's more and more legislation that really limits their activities and their, their movements within the state um, or the colony of New York and, and later on the state, but in, within the colony of New York. And um, there's, there's um, within the cities, they have guards to actually like watchmen to actually patrol the streets and ensure this. We see that there's patrols, similar kind of patrols in, in more uh, rural communities as well to make sure that any unsafe people try to run away, that they are, are retrieved, that there's no irregular activities. So there's a lot of this like cracking down on the activities and, and in large part because the numbers are growing and because the resistance is growing. And um, quickly, because I, I want to <laughs> move on to um, Michael and Margaret, but um, so therefore, what types of resistance uh, uh, emerge? Yeah, so so the resistance is really um, resisting a lot of that legislation. So we see that in safe people when they're not allowed to actually travel the streets at night without a lantern or, or meeting with more than four people or selling goods. We see that they do that still, but they do it. Um, they travel the towns via alleyways, for example. <clears throat> they jump from yard to yard. A lot of them were at the back of the house, living in the back of the house or um, on, in, in the kitchen. So sometimes the kitchens are used to actually meet, to gather. We see this especially in the case of Beth, uh, Diane, and Pompey, who set, set um, the property of Gansevoort in Albany on fire in 1793. In one of the testimonies, it's described very clearly that they use alleyways, they use, they, they jump from yard to yard, they actually meet in one of the kitchens before they, they travel because that's a safe space. They know the when the watchmen are patrolling the streets, so they actually regulate their movement according to the, the times that they know are, are they are they can safely do so. When it comes to passes, we see people are forging passes or extending their period by using a pass that maybe is for a day or two and they, they extend that for, for more days than that. So there's these various ways that they respond to that by really um, hiding their activities when they're not allowed or, or trying to extend them in ways that, that they can do those things that they're legally not allowed to do so. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, a couple of people um, raised hands. I just want to say that what we're trying to do is we're going to get each of the speakers in here, uh, and then afterwards we'll we'll uh, allow time for questions. Uh, Michael, you are you're a numbers person. What uh, what do we get? I mean, I think a lot of historians are kind of afraid of numbers. If when we uh, take a quantitative uh, study of this, oh, for, first of all, why is that important? Well, I'm not a numbers person. I just fell into it because, um, <laughs> as an economist would say, um, you know, I have uh, it's my comparative advantage to do it because other historians aren't. Um, and that's something that bothered me when I started studying New York slavery. I'm like, well, how, how many are we talking about? Mm -hmm. what, what is this? Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but in general, there's about 2,000 slaves in New York in the year 1700, and there's mm -hmm. about 20,000 in the year 1800. And the growth is pretty linear. And I've done a, a ton of demographic work on this. So I can say uh, that I know that there's probably about 75 or 76,000 slaves that lived in New York at some point in the, in the 18th century. That is, you know, had their foot in New York, were born there, etc. cetera. Um, and I would say about 30, my, my estimate is at least 30% of those were Dutch. And that the numbers, the percent that were Dutch was was pretty um, uh, consistent over time that about 30% of that population in whatever year was probably Dutch. Most people think there's a decline because they're looking at New York City where the Dutch speaking slave population does decline, but there's a huge growth in the Hudson Valley that offsets this decline in Manhattan. So that's the first important thing to say. Um, I have looked at uh, runaway slave advertisements in the 18th century into the 19th century. 
um, as Andrea knows, there are runaway slaves earlier than that. It's just uh, they're, they're very hard to track. Um, there's not records for these things. And so to get to Russell's point, um, why is quantitative stuff so important? It's to get a hold of what we're talking about, where to look for patterns in types of things, um, but also to recognize that in the colonial period, this stuff is very difficult to find. So all of the uh, databases that I've built for my book, whether it's slave prices, uh, runaway slaves, demographic numbers. I've had to construct almost all of this myself painstakingly and then, and then analyze it one way or another. And this is something that other people didn't do or weren't willing to do. I guess I'm the sucker to spend the time uh, doing this without a research assistant. So I, I should have, but um, yeah, so that, that's the important thing. Um, why quantitative stuff is important. And so, like I said before, I have 385 runaway slave ads, which mention in one way or another that the runaway slave spoke Dutch. Um, I've coded these for various things, uh, male or female, age, location of the runaway, um, and the extent of their Dutch language abilities. Now, this is always kind of a guess, but you can infer it from the advertisement, if it says that they're bilingual or not, or if they speak Dutch and English with a Dutch accent, whatever. So I've created four categories from monolingual Dutch to bilingual um, Dutch with uh, an English accent, and then um, you know English speakers that know a little bit of Dutch. Um, so there's, there's three main takeaways. Um, from this uh, research of mine on runaway slave ads. And um, the first two um, aren't particularly interesting for the, for the theme of resistance, but the third one is about resistance. So let me get through these three real quick. Um, the first thing that I can see in these 385 ads is that we have an increasing number of runaways over time. Now, this may just be a reflection of the fact that we have more newspapers. Right. So you're just simply finding more advertisements. But I don't think that's the case. I think um, there's a real uh, number and perhaps even a real proportion of slaves in New York that are running away, um, particularly after the American Revolution. So the revolution gets their feet hot for freedom and it also encourages them to to find other free communities that they can uh, they can run away to. Um, the other interesting thing about language here is that um, uh, most of the Dutch speaking persons who uh, uh, Dutch speaking enslaved persons who run away are bilingual. And I think this is because they need English to survive as they go to New York City. Um, but even into the year 1805, 1810, you find runaway slaves that are explicitly monolingual Dutch. And you don't find them from just one place. It's not just Brooklyn. There's villages all around the Hudson Valley, up and down the Hudson Valley, where uh, enslaved Africans still speak only Dutch or, or at least no English. They may speak other languages, African languages, Portuguese, French, et cetera, from, um, that they learn elsewhere. Um, but this just shows the extent of the Dutch language um, speaking zone of New York that late. Because if you have a monolingual Dutch speaker in some village, you better believe that he's surrounded by farmers who are also monolingual or close to monolingual Dutch speakers. Um, so that's interesting. Um, my second point with this is that um, runaway slave activity is very costly. It's an economic problem for the slave owners in New York and that the numbers are very high. Um, we know from the 1850 and 1860 census, the average rate of runaways in the American South. So they asked slave owners on their plantations, how many slaves have run away in this past year? And it's a very small percent. It's like, it's, it's less than half of 1%. I think it's like a 10th of 1%. Um, in New York, it's much higher than this. And it's costly because every time you run a, a slave runs away, that's a capital loss and it's a threat to the remaining capital. If you think of slave owners owning slaves as capital, it means that every other slave they have is more likely to run away. 
And it's hard to know this exactly. I'm not sure if the Dutch rates of runaway are higher than the English in New York. We can't figure that out. I can't figure that out yet. Um, but it's certainly much higher in New York than it is in any Southern state at any point in time. Um, it's somewhere in the range of Delaware in 1860, when everyone was getting out of Delaware um, and fleeing in other directions. Um, the other important thing here is that New York is surrounded by states Pennsylvania, Vermont, um, Canada, places uh, in New York City, if you're from the Hudson Valley, where you can run away too. And so there's multiple directions for runaway slaves to head out. So my third and final point here is that slave resistance is an important part of the emancipation process in New York. Now, oftentimes people like to say, slavery died in New York for political reasons. And this is true. The legislature got together in 1785. They thought about it. 1798, they finally passed um, gradual emancipation. 1827, it ends in New York legally. Um, but there's pressure all along from slaves. And it's the runaways who are encouraging increased amounts of negotiation. So I think Andrea is absolutely correct that there's more and more restrictions on slaves as we get into the 18th century, probably all the way up until the revolution. But after the revolution, slaves are negotiating and with their masters, they're running away. And this is causing the slave owners to say, well, how about instead of running away, I give you slightly better conditions, or we sign an agreement where you work for me for 10 years and then I let you go, something like this. So this is all, this is all factoring in on the legal changes that are happening in New York after the revolution. And I think we have to credit a significant part of the death of slavery in New York to the agency of the slaves that are running away. It's not the politicians who are making the decisions on their own. The politicians are reflecting what's going on on the ground. And they say, this is gonna end one way or another. And making this gradual emancipation is trying to um, get rid of some of the struggle uh, perhaps the, the revolution that might happen um, on the ground. So I'll stop with that for now. That's uh, really interesting that um, this notion that uh, the uh, owners were feeling such pressure from the enslaved that they began to weaken the institution as a way to, to, to fun keep it functioning. Um, let me bring our third panelist in here. Um, Margaret Washington is Marie Underhill Knoll Professor of American History at Cornell University. Her specialties are African American history and culture, African American women and Southern history. She's one of the foremost authorities on the Black experience and the author of Sojourner Truths America, the definitive biography. Uh, Professor Washington, um, can you uh, situate uh, Sojourner Truth for us in this context, the context of New York colonial history, New York, uh, the state of New York, and uh, everything that was happening against the backdrop of uh, 19th century, uh, mid 19th century America? Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. And the comments uh, from the other two panelists are, are quite revealing. Um, I think one thing that we need to clarify is what we mean when we say New York, um, because there's New York City and there's rural New York. Uh, and uh, I think that the dynamics uh, in terms of Dutchness uh, are different. Uh, and in the, uh, the mid Hudson Valley and beyond, which is the, the uh, region that uh, Sojourner Truth comes from, um, there is resistance. Uh, it's not nearly as, um, and Michael can correct me on this uh, if, if uh, he's got the evidence. It's not nearly as uh, constant or continual as it is uh, in the urban sector or even in um, uh, the, the area that we now know as Brooklyn uh, or even in New Jersey, which I think also has to be brought into this because um, New Jersey was Dutch as well. Um, in rural New York, rural uh, areas, uh, which I'm saying Albany and beyond, but especially Ulster, uh, which had a very large uh, African Dutch population, uh, 
uh, there are not as there's not as much uh, flight, um, and it is very heavily Dutch because, as the other panelists know, when the British took over um, the province uh, of New Netherlands, they agreed that the Dutch could keep their language and they could keep their religion. Uh, they basically were just uh, left uh, unencumbered. And so for the rural Dutch in Hudson Valley around Ulster County, this meant that all the way up until the 1820s, uh, it was heavily Dutch. The Erie Canal is what really brought the change. First, the American Revolution, because some of the land was given to patriots for uh, their services, and then the Erie Canal. Uh, up until that time, this area was heavily Dutch, and um, there wasn't as much out and out flight uh, until the revolution. And then the revolution created uh, this opportunity. First of all, it meant that these uh, African men went uh, to areas uh, of combat with their owners, and that created a, a kind of flexibility. And then 1775 on, you start seeing notices and, and also in the records, like Cornell has some very interesting records here of um, edicts from people, uh, slaveholders, Dutch slaveholders in Ulster County uh, saying that uh, the, there are gonna be all kinds of restrictions. There's a huge uh, attempt to burn down the city of Kingston, uh, which becomes the capital uh, for the Patriots. Uh, and it's a, an effort on the part of the Dutch to the Dutch African Dutch to burn Kingston, unite with the Indians, uh, and they had already amassed powder and shot before they were the the, the plot was divulged. So that's in 1775. Uh, after the American Revolution, uh, which I think speaks to to Michael's point there is even more a uh, resistance activity so much so, but it, the other interesting thing about this activity after the revolution or just before it's over, when the British are really hard pressed to win this thing, they put out aside from the, the Dunmore proclamation, which is aimed at uh, enslaved people uniting with them. They also put out a proclamation for tenants that is quite, Dutch tenants because the land in this area is owned, the massive amount of land is owned by two or three people. One of those persons is owned by Sojourner Truth. He gets, uh, he owns at 1.2 million acres of New York land that he bought from the Esopus Indians for $200. Uh, and he goes into partnership with another prominent uh, Dutch patroon, Livingston. Um, they own all this land. They they basically rent it out to tenants. And so there's a large group of Dutchmen who are poor. These are the Dutch Boers. So when the freeholders get together, uh, the leader is Sojourner Truths. He's going to be her owner. She hasn't been born yet, but he's going to be. They get together, the freeholders, and decide they have to do something about resistance in the area. And they will not allow any tenants uh, or any white person who is not a freeholder at any of these meetings. So resistance becomes much more broad uh, in this rural uh, Dutch area. Uh, and I, I think it's really uh, important that the construction of resistance take in more than just race um, because of the significance of tenancy uh, in uh, the province of New York, uh, especially in these rural areas. And it becomes, as, as the early national period progresses, it becomes much more intense and even violent. Um, and it, it converges with the anti-slavery movement uh, that, emer that comes out of uh, the first uh, Emancipation Act, which I believe is 1799, and then finally the second one, which is 1817, but doesn't take effect until 1827. So um, it's, it's like a convergence. It's not that resistance is not a factor and an important
important one, but I think it's a, a, a convergence of various factors that we have to take into consideration. The other one is that the, the social, I guess you'd say social, socio-religious aspect of it, uh, the Quakers and the Methodists come in uh, and, uh, and they are pushing for the end of slavery. So it's not just the politicians, it's not just people like Alexander Hamilton and people who formed the New York Manumission Society. Uh, it's these other groups that come in, uh, as well as the resistance that uh, the African Dutch in the rural areas are fomenting themselves. So that's one area that uh, I look at. And then the other one for me that's really important is culture and gender. Um, and because I'm looking at a woman, an Af African Dutch woman, I'm deeply interested in female culture. Uh, and um, that becomes a form of resistance as well. I mean, I think there's something to be said for cultural resistance, uh, in, um, especially in the household. And there's something to be said for the, the difference between culture in a Dutch household and culture in an English household in terms of inclusion of the, the help, which in this case happens to be enslaved women um, and the role of uh, what is called pietism in Dutch culture. Uh, and the, I won't get into the, the mechanisms of Dutch pietism, but it was really something that was promoted by the women um, and, and it becomes a way in which these African Dutch women define themselves. Uh, and it becomes a form of cultural resistance. That is to say, they're not allowed in the churches um, because the, the, the construction of Dutch Protestantism is such so that enslaved people don't have souls. Uh, nonetheless, it's their responsibility to expose them to religion, to save their own souls. So the African Dutch women are embracing this and internalizing it and it, saying to themselves, this does indeed apply to me. Um, and spiritual egalitarianism takes hold uh, to a large extent. And this is one of the things that I get into uh, in my uh, the part one of my book on, on Sojourner Truth is the role of, of Dutch women, the role of spiritual egalitarianism, uh, and then also custom among the Dutch. Um, it's different. Uh, I don't even know if it exists in, in, uh, in British law, but in, in Dutch culture, enslaved people have a right to try and get another owner uh, if they feel they are being mistreated, uh, sometimes even going to court to get another owner. And so this creates a kind of flexibility that they use whenever uh, it's possible. And it's, it doesn't exist in the English uh, speaking uh, part of the state, the colony in the state, but it's important in uh, the Dutch part. And because, as I mentioned earlier, the English have through custom now allow the Dutch to pretty much do as they like, they continue these customs. Um, and, and it creates a kind of flexibility as well. And then finally, um, I just want to say that there was no group more adamant about uh, not ending slavery than the Dutch when these two manumission laws were being uh, debated. Uh, and all the way down to the last vote, uh, the Dutch insisted on their right to own slaves, um, no matter how much flexibility they might have in terms of custom, uh, in terms of including them in, in uh, household prayers and things like that, even though they had no souls. The point was they had a right to enslave them, uh, and they never wavered in that. And that's what Sojourner fought against. Thank you. That was a great, uh, I mean, you really uh, sketched a broad background there and, and there was just time to, to suggest uh, that the relationship between that and, and this, uh, this uh, force that Sojourner Truth became. Um, let me uh, now open it up and I'll uh, read some of the questions that have come in. Uh, this 
Cecile says, grateful to the NAF and the guests for bringing attention to the subject of African and indigenous people enslaved by the Dutch colonists. Great panel. Thank you, Professor Washington, for acknowledging the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, here's a question. Are we talking here about a definitional issue that the enslaved Africans were really servants? Of course, I'm not debating the fact that these people were discriminated. Uh, I don't know quite what the what the point is there, and I don't know if anybody wants to. Andrea, go ahead. I suspect that this is referring to the Dutch colonial period because that 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 comes up regularly, um, especially because several of these people are able to obtain their freedom, and um, I would argue strongly against that. Um, even when we look at indentured servitude, indentured servitude, uh, the, the people who are indentured servants um, have, have a choice to some extent, right? They have a contract. Um, they also, their servitude in New Netherland, if I remember correctly, and I, it's been a while since I read this, but I think it's around four to five years of indentured servitude before they would um, be free. So for enslaved Africans, they had no choice, right? They were taken from their, their homelands um, uh, violently. They um, had, um, so they had no contract. Um, they were able to obtain their, their freedom in some cases, but in many of those cases, they had been enslaved for at least 18 years. So, <laughs> And even in those cases, like the most famous is a group of men who obtained their freedom in 1644 with their wives, 11 men with their wives, their children, according to the council, including those who are to be born, will in fact be still remain in bondage. So, you know, no indentured servant um, is, it, that's not a status that that is hereditary, right? So that's another really important distinction. So to to say that they are more like servants or indentured servants, I, I would absolutely disagree with that. Okay. A couple, uh -huh. couple points there, if I can. Yeah. Um, it's curious that towards the end of slavery in New York, you do get quite a number of slaves whose status gets converted into something like indentured servitude, where they sign on for agreements for five or 10 years. Now I'm talking, this is particularly in like the 1810s. It happens a little bit before that, but as uh, emancipation is approaching, the slave owners are trying to maximize the output of their slaves. And they're fearing that these people are going to run away or they're going to be free in 15 years anyway. So why not sign an agreement with them that says, if you work really hard for five years, I'll give you your freedom early. Right. So then they can maximize and guarantee this labor. Um, the other curious thing is that in the 19th century, a lot of these memoirs of slavery in New York, the, especially the Dutch, they like to talk about my dear grandfather and his loyal black servants. Right. These were not servants. I mean, these were slaves in almost every case um, when the memory says servants. They're just trying to diminish the, uh, the word escapes me, diminish the awfulness of the situation that a lot of these people were in. Yeah, just to add, I mean, that, that was the same in, in the South, right? Like yeah. here in, in Louisiana, any plantation museum you would go to, it's changing now, but they would always refer to the enslaved people as servants. Um, so, yeah. I, I was going to add to that, that if you, uh, it may not be the case now, but the last time I went to Monticello, um, the uh, docents kept referring to the slaves as servants. Uh, and of course, we were a group of historians and we knew better, but you know, uh, it, it sounds better to say servants, but of course, Jefferson had slaves. Yeah. Uh, the question, will the panelists also be speaking to the history of Dutch profiting from their involvement in the transatlantic slave trade? While I understand the focus here is on New York, it seems important to note how much the Netherlands was involved in the slave trade to the English and Spanish American colonies. Would anyone like to uh, comment on that? I can if um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually working on a book. My next book will be about the Dutch slave ship, the Gideon, and um, the, the, the shift in the 1660s. I think it's an important decade in, um, 
really increasing the transatlantic safe trade and kind of setting up the, the infrastructure for that. And the Dutch are very important in that. And in part because they are at that point, they actually have the uh, a contract with uh, the Genoese a Genoese merchants who at that point hold the Ascento, um, which is the monopoly to actually uh, provide and save people to the Spanish colonies. So the Dutch at that particular point, and you can see that Curaçao becomes increasingly uh, a safe depot where enslaved Africans are being brought and then being um, sold and distributed across the Americas. That's uh, what happens with a lot of the ships that go to New Netherland in the 1660s. Um, but also a lot of the unsafe people that end up in the Spanish colonies and eventually the Dutch actually hold uh, the Ascento in, in various forms and various people. So um, absolutely. And actually, if we look at North America, we also yeah. see that the very first ship to have, yes. been brought, to have brought Africans <laughs> in 1619 um, was a Dutch ship, right? Yeah. We see the the two largest numbers of enslaved people brought into North America in the uh, 17th century up until 1670 are Dutch ships. So yes, they were very prominent and a lot of the safe trade also in North America came through Dutch colonies via the Dutch. So, um, so yes, it's very important. Um, someone just added a note uh, to Margaret's point. I was at Monticello in February 2020, and they were not called servants then, I guess. They, are, they were clear on the iniquities and status of the enslaved people held there. So maybe that's an update. Um, question, are there any 18th century visual depictions of Dutch slavery in New Netherlands? Well, I guess they mean in the 18th century in New York. Any resources in the Netherlands? There's a, a, a book called Blacks in the Dutch World. I can't remember. I used to have it. Alison Blakely. Excuse me? Yes. Alison Blakely. Yes. Uh -huh. Some wonderful uh, paintings and etchings in there. And then also um, there's a, a book entitled uh, An Embarrassment of Riches. Um, professor at Columbia, and he has in his book some excellent uh, artwork on um, uh, Blacks and Dutchmen working. Uh, it's Simon Schaman's book. Schaman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, a question. With the American Revolution 250th, Erie Canal Bicentennial, and the 1827 Bicentennial, how do we get this information into the remembrances? Um, public history here how to how to make it part of the uh part of the landscape well you know the uh uh it depends on whose hands the uh Erie canal commemoration is in uh they were very prejudiced against the dutch in in terms of setting up the canal i mean i was working on sojourner truth i was amazed at the kind of comments in the newspapers uh looking for workers uh to work on the canal and there would be comments like, uh, Dutchmen need not apply unless they are pretty well Yankee-fied. Um, so it, it's, it's very interesting. And, and this is 1822, 23, and especially 1827. And this is the same year that uh, the emancipation of uh, adults in New York takes place. But it was interesting to me that that prejudice uh, was still there. So however they handle it, uh, I, I have no idea. Um, this is um, someone named Madeleine Van Leer, L-I-E-R, is asking, how would I go about finding if the Van Leers own slaves? So we could broaden that to how does anyone find uh, <laughs> if their family owns slaves? I have no idea. Um, well, I, I can contribute a few things on this. First, let me say that the curator at the Brooklyn Museum, I forget what it's called, and I forget his name, I can look it up later and tell you, has recently just published a booklet of 100 and so pages. And he had, there's lots of paintings on um, slaves in New York in the 18th century. So those are probably the best depictions. Um, as far as whether your ancestor had a slave, so I have created a quite large database now on slave sales in New York. Uh, 
um, including the name of the slave, the age, the person who sold them, the person who received the slaves, where they were sold and the price. And I've done this so that I can chart slave prices over time to say whether they've gone up or down. Anyway, in that I have, I think it's close to 2000 sales now. And so um, that's going to have, that's going to, um, include only a very small percent of the slave owners in New York, but I could very easily type in a name like Van Leer and see if it comes up, if they were ever sold in that. Um, I think there is some census, I forget which one, that says whether the families had slaves. Um, so uh, if, you, if you look at the 1790 census, for example, and, and look under the family names for New York, you'll be able to see um, whether they're listed, but you won't get the slaves' names or anything else like that. Can I add something? Um, okay. John Jay College in New York actually has a database that you can search. You can look for it online, and it, it, I'm not sure what the name of it is, but if you look for slavery, John Jay College, or um, uh, slave owners, John Jay College, I, I know it will come up. And if you have trouble finding it, you can always email me and I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, it's not, you know, perfect, but it has a lot of that information. So that might be a resource to actually start looking by putting in that last name. Um, I also know that, um, and I'm sure, you know, it's the same with Michael. Um, I have a lot of the records transcribed on my computer. Sometimes I get emails from people who ask me these questions and it honestly is just like two minute for me to do a search of my computer for a name. And if nothing comes up, I'll let you know. If something comes up, I will let you know. So, um, and I'm sure there's other historians who are working on this topic, who've gone through these records, who, are, who would be similarly, you know, happy. So easy these days, right? With with the word <laughs> processor, you could just search it and, and it'll come up. Um, but I would start with going to that database or or the database that Michael is creating. I don't know if you know if that becomes available at some point. But J College is is live online. You can use it right now. So, uh, right. I think we're past time. There are other comments and questions. I'll just note one here. I see Ronnie Bear, whom I know, who's a great uh, art historian at Princeton, uh, apropos of the question about images of slavery, points out that there's a new, uh, there's an exhibit now at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam on slavery, and there are lots of images there, including online that you can uh, look up. Um, thank you all. This has been a wonderful discussion, lively. Mm -hmm. I've got so many questions I didn't even <laughs> begin to ask. Um, Willemijn and Damien, can I turn it over to you? Absolutely. Thank you so very much, Russell, for uh, for your time and your thoughtful leading of the discussion. And thank you, Professors Delma, Masterman, and Washington for joining us today. Um, this has been a fascinating uh, and really important conversation. So, so thank you. Um, I wish that we had another hour. I would, I would love to to be able to answer all the questions that come in. I have tons of questions as well, uh, but I, I cannot thank you enough for for participating in today. Um, for those of you who have watched, we will be putting uh, the webinar online on uh, the Vimeo channel of the NUF, and I know that Rias will put it on the YouTube ch channel of. Uh, of the RIAS website as well. So um, if you want to want to listen back or share this with your friends, uh, it will be made available shortly. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. you all. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank